Welcome to Fret Buzz the Podcast. My name is Joe McMurray. And I am Aaron Sefchik. And today we have my friend Ryan Brown. He's the guitarist of The Great Noise, and he works signal chains at Alpha Music in Virginia Beach. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. We're glad to have you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I met Ryan at the store, and uh, he was telling me about the fact that he doesn't use amps anymore, real amps, and I'm like, I love my Fender Princeton Reverb, and I was like, you gotta, it's gonna take some convincing, and and he uh, he actually took the time recently to show me Helix, and anyway, and I've gotten to know you, and it's, you know, I've listened to your music too, uh, the great noises, got some really, really nice, I mean, the quality of the production is really nice, and your guitar tone is fantastic. Ooh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Jumping right into it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how did the Great Noise form? Yeah. So, the Great Noise uh, was formed by my best friend Corey and I. We've been friends since we were kids. Um, I got out of the army and came home, and we would just kind of jam. And uh, we started writing some songs like out of my office here and uh one day it was like hey man you want to just you want to try to do this full time and he's like yeah i think i'm gonna sing <laughs> and he's never, never really sang before and uh yeah he would do a bunch of guys together and it, it worked a guy that i used to play with when i was a kid danny uh he's a drummer and then uh we found jake through craigslist and literally just the strongest guy in my opinion you know just shows up you know, keeps his mouth shut and plays and all his ideas are always really fruitful um, he's one of my favorite people <laughs> so just it all it all clicks um yeah craigslist is incredible it uh you know you you can have it can be hit or miss but i got my bass player for albino rhino and he's i had him he came in he was the first interview we had off craigslist and he showed up and played a couple songs and we're like, okay, <laughs> get yeah. in the band. How? Yeah, I think it, t- it takes something solid like that. Like someone just come in and be like, here, I can do it. I said, yeah. oh God, thank you. <laughs> How long has The Great Noise been together? Uh, we started, officially started in March uh, of last year as a full band. Okay. Uh, so it's yeah since March of last year we're coming we're coming up on creeping up on two years here soon it's gonna be nice yeah. put out a couple singles we're gonna release an album next month yeah and so for our listeners out there who haven't heard the great noise I mean you guys from the couple songs oh. I've listened to the singles that you put out it it has to me well Aaron said Stone Temple Pilot sound I hear some I hear the vocals remind me a little bit of D- Dave Grohl um, yeah I mean it's it's like got some great instrumental sections, but it's it's definitely rock. Oh yeah. You know, the yeah. guitars have, you know, there's some nice overdriven guitar sounds and, but with more re or delay than, it's definitely not punk or anything. It gets a little spacey, uh, for sure. Um, yeah. You know, we want to have our heads up, you know, and like enjoy the room we're in. Nowadays, you know, as you guys know, it it, it takes a lot to get into a good size room and st- and be welcomed back. Right. Yeah. So with that, you know, we focus uh, 50% of the focus on this band's live performance. You know, we use lights on stage, they're programmed. We do all that ourselves. Um, mainly so we don't have to hire a light guy, but also because we're nerds. Um, we want to be able to get in there and play something a little more simplistic so we can have our heads up and see each other and have fun with each other. There's a synergy. I feel like the audience can relate to that a little bit more. Yeah, there's not. It's when you go and see a band and everybody's just kind of looking down and doesn't look like they're having fun. It it doesn't make me want to have fun, even if the music. Right. Good. It helps to have an interactive band up there. Yeah, I want to. I want to play guitar, not carry a shovel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're playing music. You're not working, even if you're being paid. It's the best job on earth. Right. Are you guys recording? You said you're recording at one of the local studios here. We did. So we finished officially finished 
uh, tracking at Flagship Studios in Virginia Beach. Um, the engineer there is Kyle Hines, and I have worked with him before, and he he's done a couple of our singles that we have out. The guy's brilliant. I connect with him. Um, he's also one of those people that like he can he can give it to you straightforward. Like this sucks, and this is why, and I love that. So the album, album's done, uh, the master is done. We're waiting on merch and stuff like that to kind of get finalized. And then I'm uh, yeah. going to throw it on out there into the vicious pond of new music that's being released here in the next month. Yeah. Before we dive into that idea of the vicious pond, I wanted to, you said something about the way that you're, that engineer, you know, he tells it to you straight. Um, we've actually had a couple, we've had, uh, Tynes Hampton studio engineer that I worked with. Um, he's out of Alexandria, Virginia. He came on the show, I don't know, somewhere in the teens. It was early on. Yeah. And, uh, Aaron does a lot of audio engineering and, um, we had on Chris Graham of Chris Graham mastering and talked about more studio stuff. Um, but yeah, they're like having someone who tells you who has an opinion in the studio is extremely helpful. Um, and welcomed. <laughs> yeah, but I guess yes. you do have to, you know, you got to be careful not to, I guess I could turn off some people, but you're going to come out with a better product, I would Oh, think, sure. Every time. It was so funny, too, because, like, he sat us down. We did a, we did, so we did pre-production, and... That was probably pre-production was two weeks before we actually started tracking. So it was like, here it comes. And um, we, within the first 10 minutes, it was, I wanted to ask him like, hey, you know, I could really want your input on this. Like, could you be upfront with us? Like, you hear something that doesn't sound right. You know, will you let us know? Like, don't just give me the green, green light. Um, and before we could even say anything, he was like, look, I just want to let you know, like, I'm going to be involved in this. I'm not just going to give you a green light. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy. You got to trust your engineer. No one knows the room better than that guy. It doesn't matter how much schooling you've had or what your approach is to recording. You're walking into this guy's space. His ears hear this room every day. Mm -hmm. You're going to go in there. And you're just going to do what you do and trust that this guy does his job. But that's what it takes. You have to, you have to trust the guy. Uh, and like I had said, I've known, I, I'd worked with him before and I respect him as an engineer. Um, but the whole process was just seamless. I just, yeah, it was the best experience I think I've had in a studio. And I've done, I've done quite, quite a lot of studio work. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like, like you were saying pre-production is um as soon as you go through that process with a with an engineer uh producer uh you know right away if it's going to be a, a perfect fit or not if if that person has their their crap together i mean right like you said the moment he he said you know i'm going to be involved in it that's like oh, perfect uh, and there are oh. plenty of people out there who don't want the engineer to touch their stuff. <laughs> right. Um, but, yeah. but <clears throat> I think it's important that, uh, that you at least let that person, because they are familiar with the room and they are familiar with working with hopefully a lot of other people that they have the experience where they can kind of chime in here and there and say, Hey, maybe this, or Hey, maybe that. And that's that trust factor with that, with that engineer they don't for you know two weeks or three weeks or however long you're recording they become that fifth member of the band you know sure oh yes and even afterwards you know like because kyle kyle doesn't really let this on to a whole lot of people but he actually he's played in some some killer bands mm -hmm. and he's one awesome songwriter and one hell of a composer uh, when it looks, you take a step back and look at the overall composition, the guy's got it. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was the most comfortable process That's awesome. I could have asked for. That's Were cool. there points in your, like in the course of recording this album where he suggested um, other parts to go into the song that weren't necessarily there originally? Like, 
oh, sure. different different harmony lines, different percussive elements. Yeah, like we did. So we do a lot of you know, for those of you out there that don't know. Uh, we do a lot of like kind of like spacey alternative rock. You know, I'm 32. That's my era. You know, I grew up listening to the Pumpkins and, and Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, but also like U2, you know, and like really dimensional types of music as well. Lots of effects and stuff. And I didn't really get a whole lot of opportunities growing up to play that stuff. Now I'm with my best friends and I play it every day. Um, and it's, it's super fun. But being in a studio element and having somebody with another ear, we'd be playing like, you know, this part. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's super cool. Kyle back, no, that sucked. Let's do this. And then he'll put an Ebo in my hand. And now I'm doing this really ethereal thing. But, like, you take that out, you miss it. Like, you listen to playback and you're like oh man that's why i'm paying all this money yeah. <laughs> i get it now yeah. um a lot of time a lot of things like that would happen yeah that's um, awesome we're not a solo heavy band i'll throw i'll throw some licks in there sometimes but it's not really about that and he he definitely pushes me to add more of me in there and that felt good i felt like i could be confident you know, throwing this Phrygian or Mixolydian lick down or hybrid of such just for color. And it was like, oh, that, hey, you're right. That does make sense. So again, going back to what you're we saying in the beginning, it's trusting and listening to your engineer or producer, whoever's wearing both hats or four hats or whatever. I, I've had uh, an experience with an engineer in Northern Virginia who is, it was a somebody's basement studio. It was a kind of a weird deal, but he had a bunch of uh, he had a lot of different amps and guitars available, and like it was one of my favorite experiences because the I came in the drums and the bass were already tracked, the rhythm guitar was already tracked, and there was scratch vocals, and he's just like, I had my Fender amp and my Stratocaster at the time, and he's like, use this, he, and like I think we tried several different amps, and I think I I played like two or three different guitars on that, you know, that one session, like in on different tracks and it, he knew what would produce the sound that we needed for that track. So I, I think I recorded on e, uh, ES339 on one track through a marsh lamp. Like I just got to try a bunch of stuff and it, it really opened my eyes to like, like I, I love my Fender amps, but right. there are other things out there. And yeah. uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and in terms of the studio, that's one of the most valuable places where it would be most valuable to have that, um, the ability to have lots of different tonal options. Uh, oh, yeah. Which kind of brings us right around to the fact that, like, your the Helix system, it, for me, like, while it's, it's, it's really complicated, you know, to sit down and go through it once, like, it's not just like turning on my amp and hitting my favorite overdrive pedal and tweaking right. the the EQ a little bit. But there are definitely times where I could see it being tremendously beneficial to be like, okay, Vox, press a button. Right. Like, there you go. Try a different speaker cabinet. There you go. It would be incredible in the studio. It It is. Um, the, I would, I would, all right. So I was raised in an analog environment, first of all. Okay, like, I didn't come from a whole lot of money. You know, you wanted something really nice. You could work for it. You know, I had a bunch, you know, still do have a bunch of vintage pedals and stuff, and I love them. But we got to a point where it was two twins on stage, you know, a 200-pound Mesa bass rig and three 70-pound pedal boards, like, no, no. I live on the third floor. Shape. Yeah, I, I live on the third floor of an apartment complex. It's three o'clock in the morning. Like I know I don't drink, but it still sucks carrying that stuff upstairs. And that's not not saying that's the main reason why we ended up doing it. But we wanted to consolidate our rig and start looking at more production. We wanted to have the ability to have really any effect that we possibly could imagine 
or more really at our fingertips and it took some time and it really came down to all of us at practice one day and it was just like everybody just clicked by now just you know like there we go we're, we're doing it you know 2000 watt qsc you know reference helix floorboard backpack let's all do it and roll the dice and we spent a month programming um <clears throat> I think out of everybody, I use the most sounds because I play lead uh, and do a lot of the ethereal, like kind of ambient stuff. But I remember Corey coming over to my house with his reference and his Helix because he got his actually came first. And we're doing an A and B with the twin in a room. And uh, so my pedal board, my twin, his rig, his reference. And I was. I was just, uh, all right, I'll do this now. <laughs> it, it was ama- It was amazing. And like, I am huge on, so I've had line six products before and like, there is a digital sound. That's, that's a real thing. So when we unwrap that, what is that digital sound? You know, it's usually in the higher registers, the higher Hertz, you know, you start taming that back. It's almost like you want it to have a dull sound. And you make up for that in presence and EQ or compression, depending on what rig you're running. But it, it's the best thing our band has done. Um, I'll probably never play with an amp on stage again. And I'm on video, and this is recorded. Yeah, that, that's a really yeah. bold statement. Well, I, I'm serious. It makes, <laughs> it makes sense. I mean, I've heard it time and time again from... It doesn't matter what professional, um, but if you're a touring band of any capacity, doing something like a Kemper or a Helix is just like, <laughs> there's no question. Yeah. <laughs> it just it yeah. just makes sense. Yeah, and I immediately went to my boss, and I was like, look, uh, there's this. I own one. Um, I've been gigging with it. It works out, like we should really bring it in. And we did, you know, the, the, the unit sells itself. You don't have to be an audio engineer to use it. There's other like products that I've used before. I won't name. Um, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult learning curve, you know, and I, my bachelor's is in audio. So like, I couldn't imagine somebody who's so, super green, sitting down for the first time trying to navigate around a platform like that. It's especially when the whole goal is to have a more creative palette. Hmm. That, that's how I look at this stuff. It's, it's like for the last 21 years I've been finger painting and now I have this digital iPad that I can literally write. And, you know, we were going to look at the differences between analog rigs and digital rigs, it's really just that. Like I can build anything now with any alchemy, and you know, it's it's pretty, it's a brilliant system. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm proud to be able to use it as often as I do. We used it in the studio, to cut our cut our recording costs in half. Why why is that? Why would it well, make your recording cheaper? Okay, so you know, like we're gonna line up this, you know dual 412 you know offset jensen offset greenback uh, we're gonna run a slo or a vh4 and then ping the feedback left and right and then i'm gonna have like this really ethereal ambience behind there that comes from this spring reverb tank and then this offset you know echo plex you know the ones where you move them just a little bit and they just break <laughs> but uh you know typical echo plex but regardless you know it, it'll take you uh, three hours to set up that rig mic it do a couple tests get the room ready pressure's good let's play i can build that patch 15 minutes you want it in any room i'll just build the room you know i use like this plugin that shows me like kind of like decay times and ceiling depths you know, for different types of reverbs, I can just go in there and build that within my system. 
you know, not saying that it's super authentic by any means. Um, but I mean, it's authentic enough to where if you're in a mix with seven or eight other elements, no one's going to be able to be like, oh, well, that reverb was this profile of X, Y, and Z from this or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it basically cut your, it cuts time in half. You know, that's what, that's what pre-production is for. It's like, okay, I'm going to have this list of sounds. Here's my scratches. Everything's set up. This by set list is what I'm going to have in the studio. You know, that's why I was like, this pre-production was so quick. You know, from the time we had pre-production to tracking was two weeks. I had two weeks. We had two weeks to really build these patches. And of course we went in there and, Kyle's like, well, this sounds good, but let's just completely erase this and start from the beginning. And you can do that on a Helix, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. Hmm. Uh, I would like for you to expand a little bit more on, like, some of the useful things that I was watching you do was the way that you were using multiple EQs and sometimes splitting the signal chain um, hmm. to try to create a more realistic or more analog sound. And I know you said, you know, taking off some of the top end digital sound, oh. but just like for somebody who's got a Helix, like what are some pointers to really dial in that sound a bit better? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like we look at, to give you a better example, we could, we can unwrap it briefly from like the IR stage. So we use impulse responses, which is basically like the, the speaker moving air almost like a measurement. Take a Celestian Green back. It'll live between like 56 and let's just say 16.5K. Um, so an impulse response is automatically going to take that measurement and that's where your sound is going to come from. It's going to emulate the response, to the frequency measurement of the speaker. So we'll do like kind of like a checks and balances inside the system. Like, you know, I'll split the signal as you saw and I'll do like a lighter compression on the top end and then bring, you know, a low pass filter back. Or, you know, we'll do the bottom end. We'll compress that a little bit more, you know, like almost mimicking the natural sag and reaction of an amp. We don't have to overdo it. We want it to breathe. But you can do small things like that that bring the life out of the profile more. They're good profiles. I mean, they, they are. I mean, like I've, I've A and B'd them with Kemper and, Max effects and other, I mean, I did a lot of research into this going into it. And if you have just a basic fundamental of audio, just compression and EQ, you can make that thing do anything you want. Approaching it like that, you know, splitting the signal and being able to tailor the top and low end specific ways. I mean, you can even become more of a nerd with it and do three bands we really want it to be a nerd, um, which I love. But there's small approaches like that take that tinniness out, or it'll take just the opposite. It'll take the flubbiness out. Really anything below, what, 55? Maybe even a little bit more than 60? I mean, it's not audible. That's mud. Take that out. If you're, if you're running live sound, you're never going to be below 150 playing guitar. Yeah, your your fundamental is you're not you're out of your fundamental range at that point. Your your whole goal is to sit in a mix, you know. Uh, so approaching it like that, this is how I want to sound with my dudes. And then also like, here's my guitar tone. This is as authentic as I can get it, and all the unnecessary artifacts are out. So I like to split chain and do some side chain compression just to. I mean, because you can. Yeah. Expand on that for me. Yeah, you know, it's, so you, you'll take your whole, you'll take the entirety of your signal, split or not, and you can actually run that down two separate processors, run this board. You have one that handles the top and one that handles, handles the bottom of the four rows. And this allows you to not have an overload of CPU, but also provide you the headroom to get the most out of your effects. I mean, we're looking at 96K, a lot of definition and power. That's a lot. 
a lot of power, a lot of a lot of meticulous definition, especially with some of these ambient reverb generators out nowadays, you need that headroom. So, you know, if we were going to bring that chain out, we were going to decide, you know, bring a dry down or a wet down and just process that and blend it back in like you do in a studio setting, busing, you know, um, or parallel compression. I mean, that's, it just adds to it. And you, you're like, oh, I can get away with this. And, oh, I miss it if it's not there. It's not... It just brings a little bit more girth. And like I say, you take 150 out of your mix live, like 150 and down, put a high pass on, just typically what you'll do in some cases, depending on the room. Uh, it's a lot of girth gone. Gonna want a little bit of that back. Okay. Okay, so you're basically doubling your signal, but with just different slight process slightly differently. I'm gonna compress the the hell out of it and blend it back in okay yeah yeah that's I and mean, that is the definition of parallel compression like on vocals or something right you don't yeah, always one have that, to one that's compressed and one that's much more natural yes essentially in some aspects you don't always have to really squash it but right, right. yeah it does it does uh, or you know like in a studio setting we would if we were going to compress eight or nine tracks the same way, it would make more sense to group them and send them and process them with one compressor. It actually would glue it more. It would sound more of a, a well put together, transparent mix overall and cut down on the processing power of your computer. Yeah, it, it's more efficient. Okay. Have you ever used one of these helixes, Aaron? No. No, I've seen them, but I've never actually used one. I was definitely glad I got to go into the store and Ryan showed me showed me how to use it because I was trying to watch YouTube videos and you know, you can watch YouTube videos, but anything with real sound, I feel like you just even if you wear your really nice headphones, which does help, it's not the same as playing something. No. And right. one, hearing the actual sound in a room, but two, it also you know, feeling it because Playing a, a tube amp has a feel to it. The SAG has a feel to it. There's, you know, you can, it, it's almost like a lag. We've talked about this with Miles yeah. Harshman on one of our previous episodes, but uh, it was cool. He was, Ryan actually uh, was able to adjust the SAG on the Helix to give it more of that natural feel. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool system. I don't think I can yeah. afford it, but... <laughs> and, I, and I'm and I'm very happy with my system, but I'm glad to know that that's an option, and I wouldn't be opposed to it in the future. Yeah, you were showing me videos of what you do, mm -hmm. and I was I was taken back. I mean, man, that's good. Oh, Just the one man you. band, you know, with the you have the Trio Plus, right? Yeah, the Digitech. Oh man, dude, that is just too cool. And you did you tell me that you have the loaded like cards like the memory cards and like dude yeah. Yeah. you're a you're a monster <laughs> thank you you are a monster that's very kind of you but i yeah it, that trio plus i'm i'm working on getting digitech to give me a some sort of endorsement because i feel like i i tell everybody i meet how awesome that that pedal <laughs> is because i i believe it with all of my heart i like it's my band and i paid three hundred dollars for it and now i paid nothing for it like they're yeah. never they're never late to practice they never complain they're never out of time oh. yeah the trio plus is uh it takes these micro sd memory cards and each card holds 12 song slots so i run like 11 songs pre-programmed on each memory card and i leave one blank for any sort of live anything that's sim a simple progression like Ugh. say Chameleon by Herbie Hancock, I'll do that live. Like I don't need to have a pre-programmed right. loop for that. And I kind of enjoy building that live and, you know, yeah. I think it's part of the show. But it's not, if you have a song with multiple song parts, it's much better to do it ahead of time. Right. Like right. You, just, you know, just have the basic progression at least looped in and under different piece, different parts and you can switch live between the parts. So if you right. want to like take a solo and 
talk to the audience afterwards or whatever. Like I was playing on Atlantic Avenue on Friday night and um, I was playing, I think I was playing like run around by blues traveler, just like nineties oh, yes. rock. And I took yeah. a big guitar solo for a minute. And then I, these kids were hanging out and I went into the Flintstones theme and, <laughs> and then I was like, you know what that is? You know, I just kind of like, it doesn't matter how long I stay on that song part. Because right. I can change back and forth anytime I want. So it gives me that flexibility. I can, I think I muted the bass or, yeah, I think I muted the bass and I was able to talk to the audience and then say like, okay, what's this one? And I played Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and, you know, you just have, it's an just amazing product that you can, <laughs> you can mute the drums, mute the bass, change the feel to double time. You can make the bass go to like root and fifth or just roots or the normal busy thing. And it's right. got, it's it's a cool product. So, it uh, doesn't awesome. have any of the tone shaping abilities that of a helix, but it's got its other, just totally different tool. Yeah, I bet. Box. I bet Corey or Jake wish that they had like an off button for me. Like, oh, you know what, Ryan, off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I promise. But um, yeah, you were you were explaining the rig, and I saw the video, and I was just like really taken back because it's. It's not that it, it's not that it just sounds like it's really well done, you know, yeah. and yeah. Uh, not, and you're a good player, you know you are. So, yeah, compliments where it's due. Yeah, it it's amazing what, it looks weird to be on stage and have the sound of a full band, like four piece band, and it's just like one guy standing up there on this big stage with a Princeton reverb. <laughs> oh yeah. But, yeah, it works. I don't th I don't think that. What it will never be able to do is follow your energy level. Oh, I, God, I know. I miss anytime playing with a real band and, like, you have to work far harder when you're playing a guitar solo with a trio or to, like, bring out the dynamics to, you know, you go in, you're, like, trying to come to the climax of a guitar solo or something, and, like, it's still doing what it's doing. Like, it doesn't, it's not like the drummer's going to, like, a crash cymbal and, like, going crazy on it and the bass player is not like changing register or doing anything to build that energy so you have to really do it all yeah. like and oh, you can't yeah. there's definitely been times early on where like i try to you know you're building and then you you try to do like some sort of line that's not like some like double stop kind of bend big bends and it sounds like it kind of falls out from under you if you let right. up on that energy at all so you have to play kind of in a specific way in order to not let those, you know, its faults, its uh, shortcomings come through. Yeah. But, Let's see, I feel like we work so hard as musicians to create that moment. Like, I feel like EDMs probably, and I, I don't listen to any any of that music, but like they've mastered the build up and drop. You know, mm -hmm. I think about what we've been trying to do, like next up for us, you know, we're trying to incorporate backing tracks which is not necessarily as the same as what you're doing, but kind of similar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like for our production, you know, Danny's on a click, all the lights are written to a click. Mm -hmm. That information is sent out MIDI to DMX. So I don't have to hire a light guy, essentially. That's why we did it, you know. And we can put any type of lights we want on stage and be able to handle, you know, facilitate it in pretty much any show we can, you know, we can get on, whether we're using house lights or our own. But incorporating backing tracks, it's like, man, you know, like, here's this massive buildup, and like it's getting really vocal, and it's getting really, he you know, here we go, and then it drops, and it's like, well, well, what if he's off like by a beat? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's scary, you know. It is. We haven't had anything like that happen yet, but I, I, it's going to be like some festival, or you know, some, some bigger room show that we have where the system is like more now we're running more complex, uh, performances or production. And then all of a sudden one day my, my trusty computer's going to be like, you know, I think you got the most out of me, you know, uh, I'm going to check out, you know, it's going to be right at that drop or something, you know? And of course, like an audience member is going to be like, Oh, well, you know what, Bob, that was pretty good, but it's not going to make me forget nine 11. And you gotta start over again and it yeah you can't 
the electronics they can let you down sometimes but i also feel like they don't let you down as much as a person and you know they just don't that's if that's... it's your fault if you mess it up is how i feel the times that my electronics have let me down has been more my fault if you actually like break it down what happened yeah yeah uh, i mean see, I, I, and i i love relying partially on a computer uh i totally make mistakes like i'm happy to admit that uh but a computer's pretty accurate it's gonna be as honest as it can be i mean it's it's a machine and that's um, where it's your fault if you got off time that's like, right <laughs> And they didn't follow you in your incorrectness. That is your right. fault, ultimately, not the computers. But well, now they're making a product. Um, it's uh, a Ditto Looper, where it's got a contact mic. It comes with a contact mic. Wow. It's a regular looper. It's like the hardest thing to do in a live setting is loop. This will track your snare hits and adjust flex time to your recording without pitch like it won't change the pitch right that's nuts that's pretty cool where is that technology in pro tools <laughs> i and if you know email me because that's why i'm trying to learn ableton i've been spending like i'm certified by avid and i'm a certified logic user and i've got those certifications through school but basically i'm spending like my extra time learning ableton because I just feel like it's really inspiring to look at. Like it's dull, you know, it's gray. Yeah. It's just like you look at it, it's very unappealing. It's like, cool, I just want to work. You know, I don't want 50 different color options for this or this. You know, like I, I want the looping and the composition capabilities and the live use. It makes more sense. It's more efficient. So, they, you know, in talks of relying on a computer, I'm going to probably start doing that more as we as we move into this next quarter after the album's out, I'd like the whole production to be off of Ableton. Since that's its format, Pro Tools is just, and Logic, it's just so, it's, it's thirsty. It's a thirsty program. It needs a lot of power. It needs a lot of juice. So. So recently we interviewed Billy Browse of Papadocio, and Papadocio is like a big, touring uh band that plays a lot of festivals they just played red rocks um and billy plays keys and synth for papadocio and i saw them actually play at elevation 27 and they they run a lot of backing tracks and but they also or maybe actually maybe not backing tracks they run ableton though i believe yeah. is what he said yeah and they like like they're working the computer big time and they they actually also have a phenomenal light show Right. Like it's really good. They each have a screen behind each player and they stand in a big uh, arc on stage. Yeah. So nobody's in the middle and the lights are, are really good. Yeah. yeah. So I, he was telling us in the episode how they set it up. So each screen, like if you play a certain frequency, it does a certain color and does a certain thing. And Oh, and, that's clever. Yeah. Depending on what, you know, signal is being sent. So it's like, wow. That's cool. that's a, that's like a it's almost like they put a ducking compressor on there to it like identify certain things to trigger oh man that's nerdy I'm into that yeah yeah um, yeah <laughs> I'm into that lights are lights are really important to us I mean if we if if we play a par show and people are like oh man but those lights are amazing I'll take that <laughs> <laughs> it makes a huge difference as an audience member too you know it just like the whole full body experience is more complete with visuals. Oh, sure. And the lights can, you know, just having a strobe effect or flashing lights during that buildup of your guitar solo or the climax of your song makes it that much more exciting, which could be the edge to make somebody remember you and want to download your album or. Oh, sure. Yeah. The you. Time, you hit the nail on the head, the timing of that. That's, that is, it's one thing to throw a bunch of lights on stage, which is what we used to do. You know, we live in a very DIY focused area uh, when it comes to playing out. We get a lot of like, you know, like 
raised eyebrows they see us come in there with these processors and like there's six thousand watts on stage <laughs> and we've got these lights and you know like they're all programmed and there's this computer and there's this brain and you know what's this blue box doing here and you know people kind of forget like we did all this by hand you know it's not strapped onto like a two by four or anything when it comes to programming lights and building a moment it's all on timing you have to you have to meticulously get into your set and be like cool this part here is blue okay well what shade of blue what what's the build-up look like how are we gonna how are we gonna visually enhance this part and it's just trial and error yeah. you know and we don't sleep like i'm doing this podcast with you i'm gonna go do this photo shoot with the guys for the album and then we're programming lights because we have uh, a benefit show this friday for the nara the, it's like kind of a bunch of bands from the area just giving back and wanting to you know, build more of a community which i feel is even more important than being a diy band you know there's definitely a community here and it makes you proud you know <laughs> we yeah. get to we get to be nerds and work for a cause there's so much stuff going on in the world today i i want to make sure you know all the effort i'm putting into this you know goes into somebody else's hands too for benefit i feel like that's important it's always nice to play for more than the drunk people at the bar. Oh, sure. <laughs> Something sure. a little bit more important. Yeah, yeah I mean, I can... I'm totally fine shaking my ass on stage in front of drunk people. But do it do it to benefit someone else, too. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I want to I wanna go back to something you said about the colors. Um, just because last night, randomly, my, my old bassist is in town um, visiting me, and he's like, I need to watch this video that my bandmate sent me and it was how Jack White uses color. It's this video that is on YouTube and uh, it was pretty fascinating. He like branded him, his band, the white stripes with the colors, red, black, and white. And all of their, every show, every album cover, every music video is built using those colors. And he, he was very specific about using colors and shades of those colors to create emotion in the music and like they did some cool stuff changing the reds to blues and showing the same music video sections and right. you're like oh i kind of see it like yeah it's not a huge difference because the music is the same but the the color can actually bring out the the emotion more from people oh 100 percent, 100 percent. and even from a, no a nerd platform you know we it's marketing you know? yeah yeah not yeah. trying to take anything away from his artistic value whatsoever, but you know, what do you pay more for insurance on a red car? Why? Cause it's the one you see, you know, <laughs> like it makes a lot of sense. You know? Yeah. And they were talking in the video about like, you know, Starbucks is green. It's always green. Like the logo is always green. Coca-Cola right. is always red. It's, they're saying bands don't do as good of a job typically of, branding a color right as, as a lot of product brands do yeah like uh there there's um i'm trying to think of something recent oh um do you remember what was it fire festival that like thing yeah that totally went downhill i don't even know if that even happened like, wasn't it like ja rule and billy somebody it's who's some, probably in jail now something like that i guess they like just crooks but anyways they tried to throw the festival in the bahamas right it, yeah, it was something like that. But their approach was kind of like, mm, let's see what's up. You know, like they, they hired, I guess, like a team. I watched this documentary, and from what I, my takeaway of it was, like, they hired a team for marketing the event, really dove into color schemes and, like, eye-catching media content. You know, they had the woman luxurious on the beach, you know, like, the fruity, colorful drinks. But the one thing that, like, really stood out was – their logo color. It was the complete opposite of how we perceive like a marketing color scheme. You know, we're looking at like a really dull, like a orange yellow and then black. But it just, no matter what, scrolling, 
you know, cause we stroll a million miles a second. Mm. It should be in the Olympics, you know, but we see that come, Oh, oh fire festival. You know, and I think like, I'm happy to see a lot of businesses and brands and stuff like that taking over the branding aspect. That's a big word now, branding. I mean, think like three years ago we were like, well, at least me, I was just like branding. I'm, you know, I'm just going to be me. I'm going to get on stage. I'm going to throw my guitar around and I'm going to get off. I'm going to shake a couple of hands and maybe have a Coca-Cola and leave. Like, how much more branding do you want? You know? But nowadays we're, it's definitely a different story. Um, just a lot of my focus at the shop, you know, I handle a lot of the social media and stuff like that there. Yeah. So go that that's a perfect segue into, you know, the fact, I mean, I, I struggle with it. It's just difficult to maintain a social media presence that is, you know, interesting to people and not annoying to people. And that actually builds up an audience over time. Um, right. You know, we were talking about this and you were saying you've you spent a lot of time learning about it. And uh, like, what are some of the things that you've learned about social media marketing and brand and branding? Uh, well, aside from like fundamentals that you pick up through school, really, it's just you got to try to stay a couple steps ahead, which is I know it's almost virtually impossible because you're like you're standing at a 360. There's really no set path. And the reason being, like, there was this awesome statistic I read from Caltech. And it was like, from the point man, we have seen man record information on rock with stone, you know, to 2003. So it's every culture, every scientific book, every law book, every language, um, medical, everything, every single piece of information. That from that moment to 2003, why 2003? I don't know. But uh, essentially, we triple that bulk of information, that that size of information. We triple that every day on social media. That's nuts. Yeah. So we're looking at this fog. It's a really dense fog. I'm into fog because <laughs> fog is very thin. Uh, it appears you can't see through it, uh, but I don't. I love a challenge, you know. Like uh, you kind of have to approach it like that. Like there, it's goal setting when it comes to social media. Small goals, which builds confidence, which leads to more goals being accomplished, and so on. It only takes a little bit of gas, though, to really peek out above all that. And what that looks like is the curation of content, following your analytics which Instagram gives you, um, being authentic, not too many filters, be honest. You know, people want that connection. A lot of people I see, they'll post these perfect pictures. It's like this, you look at it, it's like, wow, this person sucks because it doesn't look like they'll ever fail at anything. You know, for me at least. Um, yeah. So basically, you know, like I approach social media with the shop like kind of the same way like i photograph guitars and look at the imperfections of different pedals and use gear and like we post at certain times of the day we make sure that the colors are right you know we want to make sure that we're honest about what goes up uh, there's a lot of personality in the shop and i'm going to tell you if you want to work in the entertainment industry and you don't have a personality you're in the wrong business. You know? <laughs> and if you're afraid of, if you, you don't like being embarrassed or showing your ass, I fall every day and get mud on my face. Mm. I've learned to love it. But you have to curate content to show people that. You have to, it's, I, I almost say, I don't want to say build a personality because that doesn't sound authentic, but I want to build a window that people just outside scrolling by as you're walking, just like walking through a strip mall. You're window shopping. And it's like, well, hey, just remember, it's bright in here. We're, we're pretty funny, and uh, we carry an incredible selection of guitars. You know? And uh, I feel like that's branding. You know, I, I've gone to so many branding seminars and watched so many branding seminars when it comes to social media and marketing. 
And I hear a lot of the same thing. You'll pay $35 or 50 bucks to sit down and listen to this guy talk. And it's all the same thing. It really is. You want to create a brand and be successful, be authentic and honest with yourself and go out there and show your ass and don't be afraid to do it. And people will immediately connect with you because they don't want to see perfect. That's all you see is perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, you're not perfect. You know, but we're, we're entertainers. <laughs> I don't mess up on stage. Yeah, right. Never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Neither do I. You know? <laughs> now, do you, do you, uh, just out of curiosity, um, do you post multiple times a day? Depending on the day. Okay. And Depending you, on the day. Do you have a uh, preferred platform? Instagram. Okay. I'll, I'll do the share. You know, to share to Facebook at the yeah, same yeah. time because there are there there's a a bracket like I'm seeing there's a younger crowd that won't use Facebook anymore. No, They're like, you know what, we're not doing it. Yeah. And then there's the they will. <laughs> it's like my ger- my generation. You know, it's like, well, I'm kind of on Facebook, but Instagram's cool. You yeah, know, Instagram, whatever. Instagram is far better. Uh, right. Do, what, Facebook yeah. has lost all of its charm. To but me. It has. I can changing. talk about It's changing, though. Facebook is completely going to go away from um, this idea of... Because now when you po- post something, it hardly goes to anybody unless you pay for it. Um, yeah. But they are moving... They have specifically said that they're moving to a groups pl- platform where it, it's all about putting yourself in a community, in a group. Um, that they are going to push that hard in the future. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, uh, I don't. I, I, I feel like that's almost like building a competitive market for life insurance. Right. I uh, mean, just being honest with you, uh, when we look at algorithm-based social media, it's the bigger taste of your bone is the one that goes on the menu first. Mm. And I get that because the whole goal is to you know to objectify that content to. It's advertising, you know, I pay for ads, this pays for your platform, you may speak now. Yeah. You have 20 seconds to entertain. And then after that, you fall back into the algorithm. I get it, I, I get Facebook's importance, but I don't think it'll ever make a recovery unless they reshape the algorithm like they did in 2008. Yeah. Do you use- oh, excuse me, excuse me, 2018. Do you use uh, Hootsuite or anything like that? Mm-mm. No, I just I I keep physical notes and I look at my analytics. I mean, it doesn't doesn't take much work. You know, I look at what okay by hour and you know, by day. Yeah. You know, looking at because the whole goal on Instagram is to get organic audiences. You know, organic followers, and you can use your stories to engage your current audience and inform them you know, of course they're going to see your posts but those two things exist on that platform for a reason like use them you know like i i see a lot of places a lot of bands even they're like oh yeah you know, like uh you know we're gonna we're gonna put this hot shit you know picture up you know snap 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 got some likes and stuff like that it's cool and then uh not engage with the stories and stuff like that when you post to a story like everybody gets a notification for it it's like why not you should be doing that just as much as you're posting three days out of the week you should be posting twice take a rest day you know don't oversaturate be honest make some imperfect stuff not on purpose but don't edit the shit out of it yeah Yeah. are you familiar with michael stelzner no no i'm not okay social media marketing he's like the big one of the bigger gurus of social media marketing and um he's weekly in putting out you know pointers on facebook ads or whatever it is it doesn't matter right he's like one of the great big guys who has tons and tons and tons of information that's cool yeah that's cool i mean i read a lot you know i've got stacks of books Laying around, like always trying. I'm, I'm definitely not. I'm definitely always looking for what I can do better, because you know it's just 
not my, you know, if this is aside from the band, you know, when it comes to my shop, this isn't my shop. I work at this shop. I just so happen to love the people I work for and who own it. Hmm. They're family to me. So, of course, I, I'm, I go in there every day with this kind of stuff in the uppermost part of my mind. But, I mean, like I was saying earlier, I've paid money to watch very creative people almost do like a TED Talk. Yeah. So I almost feel like it's approached. It just, I never really got a lot of fruitful information out of it. Um, I took, a, like, a, I've taken a couple branding classes uh, through school and outside of school that I've paid for and still, like, it just didn't seem too authentic to me. And, like, I know me as a person, like, I want to connect with somebody. I need you to meet me where I am. Like, you know what I mean? And it just... My approach with social media is really just to use the tools that they provide, uh, at least with Instagram. You know, I know different other platforms have different other algorithms. And I know with Facebook, like you could turn Facebook off and say green jelly bean like 50 times throughout the day. And all of a sudden you open Facebook and it's like, would you like these green jelly beans? It's like, you know, <laughs> you know me. It's <laughs> true. Get out of there. Uh, it's true. I want to go back to something. You said you mentioned something about stories versus your feed like post normal mm -hmm. postings mm -hmm. yeah so you're saying that a story gives people a notification whereas just posting normally doesn't notify your followers well um as far as like a business account if i don't post a story regularly yeah. when i do your little computer in your butt pocket will be like hey alpha music or the great noise just posted or just you know just submitted a, a video for their story or you know, just posted to their stories or whatever for the first time in a long time or whatever oh okay first time in a couple of days uh, that active engagement because like i said you don't want to saturate the goal is to re really just reach out and just do a love tap and be like hey you know by the way i'm still here and we're still working okay you know and that that to me uh, not only lessens the workload, but it also gives me two kind of screens to focus on. I focus on my my left screen, which is all of my organic followers that I'm trying to reach. Because I mean, we're we're likable guys at the shop and like in the band, like you know, both platforms. I approach you know, in a similar way. We're likable dudes. Like we're we we've got content for days. Um, I want to get an organic following and I want to engage the people that decide to follow me like yeah you know I'll take two seconds and hit follow you know what do you got entertain me you know like okay cool yeah you want to see you want to nerd out over some gear you want to see these new pedals you know blah 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 just kind of like go down the line and I try to like in the shop make sure I hit a different section you know so it's not all saturated on one thing I'm a guitar player or at least I try to be I love effects pedals and signal chains I don't want to post nothing but guitars and pedals Constantly, I gotta make sure we're well rounded. Yeah, and the same with this. Go ahead. I was gonna say we feel the same way about fret buds. We we want to make sure we've you know have other types of instrumentalists or singers. We've we've tried to have a variety of topics Diversity. so that we don't. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think both Aaron and I really enjoy the diversity of topics. Anyway. Yep. Like, right. I love the guitar, but I. I love music and everything about music, except for maybe social media marketing. It's, not, it's probably my least favorite of all of it. <laughs> I would far rather, I would far rather play my instrument than than have to record a video of me playing my instrument. It's come, to my show, come to my show to see me. It's a necessary evil, man. I almost wish we could like starve our audience and it just be like cool, like only word of mouth. I've always wanted to do this, like, you know, start a band and it's like only word of mouth, you know? So like the only time you can hear our music is when you come see us live. I feel like we live in a content based, you know, era, which we obviously do. If you can't find something within five minutes, it immediately irritates you. Yeah. So it's like, what happens if I put on a killer show and you can't find my band? Ooh. Yeah. The mystery, <laughs> the mystery of it would be it would be kind of your branding element yeah like this elusive 
yeah. band that's awesome. Maybe you could only sell physical CDs. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sell the music at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, like that. It wouldn't be that. That, that would not be the prime business model. Um, but it would be an art, like an artistic endeavor. Endeavor. You know, like I read this. I read data from this one band. It's like they don't allow cell phones in their show. It's like a bigger band or something. Like you cannot bring a cell phone in this show. That's cool. It would That's make cool. everyone far more engaged rather than worrying about taking pictures and I yeah, I want to Snapchat. Say, or they need a Xanax. I want to say it's White Stripes <laughs> does that. I think. Perhaps I w- it wouldn't put me. Wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past Jack White to do something like that. Yeah, but. I'm pretty sure he doesn't allow any cell phones at a show. Yeah, good on him. Good on him. There's a band I really adore, and they're called Big Jesus, and they put out a music video. And basically, the music video was talking about like they like dressed up as aliens and came to planet Earth to put on a show, and everybody in the audience is like glued to their cell phones, and like no one even took the time to realize that there was somebody. Like performing in front of them, I don't know. I'm not in our and where I live, you know, in Virginia Beach and stuff. Like uh, it's a pretty tight community as far as bands and such. Um, we don't get a whole lot of people uninterested in anything else except the show. Like we have a lot of support down here. All the bands really get a lot of support, in my opinion. Uh, but I have played other places where it's like, oh man, like we should have just live streamed this, you know, and. Um, I would love to set up like a business scheme like that where, uh, you know, essentially like we would go out and play and it's, you know, a, it would be a separate band and it's only word of mouth. You can't hear our music. The only time you can see us or hear our music is if you come to a show. And the only thing we're selling at that show is tickets to the next show. That would be, that'd be a lot of fun. Just to, just to, it's not a social experiment. It's a business experiment, you know, to see if like, if you starve your audience more and there's a lack of social media and branding, what now is your brand? Would that cancel out? Would you just be, you would essentially be word of mouth. You'd be a ghost. Yeah. That's tough, man. It's good. I think it'd be cool. I think it would work on a local level, but not a um, national level. I think, it, I think it would be the, the point, you know, we're opening the door locally. Here's this vibe. And then, oh, okay, here, we're going to release a single, and then here's some, you know, light merch. You know, the typical crop tops, short sleeves, you know, everything Stickers. else you have to do as a band. You're pretty much a glorified t-shirt salesman. <laughs> but it, it would be fun. It would be fun to do. I think I might start something like that in the future and, like, you know, just to do is just to do for fun. I'd probably end up doing what the guys I play music with because I really don't connect. I haven't connected with – a group of guys like that in a very long time. And I love them dearly. So. It'll be awesome. So um, for all our audience, we won't tell you when that's happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pay attention, pay attention to your friends next door. <laughs> so I was driving and this really interesting segment, uh, came on the radio about, um, cell phone addiction in, uh, I think they were talking about in South Korea. And they actually send kids or youth to like a cell phone addiction detox detox where they oh take God. their cell phones and like make them do activities to interact with other human beings and like experience <laughs> nature. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is like my worst nightmare of like people like not being able to like it's terrible when people are like walking around looking at their cell phone and so it goes right along with what you were saying. It, it right. Went, it's like literally a <laughs> becoming a medical uh, diagn. It's sure. like an actual thing. Yeah. Now. Sure. Absolutely. Oh cell my phone, god. Cell phone, or I guess also video game. Like maybe it's not just cell phone, but screen addiction. Sure. Like, oh yeah, I like, see that. Yeah. Like you know, some screen time is fine, but too yeah. much is bad for our society when people can't interact on a human level in real life. I started doing this thing recently where I don't take my phone out of my car. Like unless I'm at work, obviously. But like if I go meet like some friends for like taco Tuesday or something like that, you know, like I won't, I won't take my phone with me because I've been trying to like disconnect from that need to physically 
see what's going on. Like even at night, like, you know, again, screen time, I'm slaving in front of my computer trying to learn this new program or design this element. And uh, I'll, I'll totally take Safari, like I'll, I'll turn off all notifications, everything on both platforms, Firefox, everything. Just work, but even then at screen time, so it doesn't count. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely go in airplane mode while I'm practicing seriously. Oh, yeah. I, can't, I can't handle the beeping. Like you can be in the middle of something really good focus and like, you know, if you get a beep or a buzz every like, you know, 10 minutes, it like, and then it, but if you don't look at it, it buzzes again. Oh yeah. God, like it, as soon as it buzzes, you're like, well, I have to like mess with this so that it doesn't interrupt me again. And then so it just ruins everything. Yeah, I used to set my my phone down on my twin, mm -hmm. and I, I play in an apartment, but I'm pretty loud. I'm a loud guy, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't care, and I give the guy underneath me like a hundred dollar gift card, like Red Robin. Or <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah, he deals with it. He's cool. I mean, we've lived, I've lived above him for like three years, and he just gets it. Like, okay, you do your thing. Like, you know, I, I'm respectful about it, but like, you know, as far as time, but you know, I set my phone down on my amp, and all of a sudden, you just hear like this satellite you know, yeah. you know it's like, okay, they're coming it's like oh, man i gotta turn this off yeah i'm always worried to put my cell phone near the amp because of the magnets in the amp i'm just like oh, worried sure. it's gonna like er erase my thousand dollar cell phone <laughs> these things are expensive yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah. Was it was it it was Graham Doby, right, Aaron? Who's he's got a studio up in. Um, yeah. He's one of our prior guests. Who's a drummer in New York City. He's got a studio in New York City. And we're like, how do you deal with the sounds there? I mean, you're living in an apartment building, trying to have a recording studio. Yeah, in New York. Oh yeah. City. He was saying that like sometimes they're loud, and sometimes the neighbors have a all night rager, and it's just oh, kind of yeah. like we're even. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I definitely have. Uh, I, I definitely have made a lot of noise here. <laughs> the greatest noises. Yeah. yeah. We, Far noise. <laughs> here in Virginia Beach, it would be it having a studio here would be difficult because so many takes would have F-18s flying over. Oh yeah. You're like, oh, that was a great take, but there was this like. <sighs> <laughs> oh yeah. Right yeah. over the best part. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm right at town center, so like, you know, we'll they'll be fly, Chinooks will be flying over us, and it's just like the whole house shakes. Yeah, and it's like, oh man, that was such a good take. It probably took you an hour and a half to get that take. <laughs> You're like, oh man, you bring up Isotope. Can I get RX in this? Right. Nope. <laughs> right. Nope. <laughs> We've actually been really fortunate because we record this podcast uh just happens to be a time when you know they're not flying right now obviously right. you're not we're not hearing it over my computer or yours so they're just not flying this morning so we're pretty fortunate with that right. if it For was sure. like one o'clock on a weekday it would be like every couple minutes and sometimes it'll happen and then as soon as it starts to trail off the next one comes and you know you <laughs> might have i'll be on the phone like I'll call or it could be my mom, whatever. And like, I'm like, just hold on. And then it, it might be like 30, <laughs> 30 seconds. And you're like, Oh my gosh, like, give me a break. Right. But you know, it's the price we pay for freedom. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm like, I have my phone over here on my you know, desk on my side table. And I'm just, I've been watching it. Just oh my man. What buzzing? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just like hearing noise, that's all. Like, you know, it, I almost feel like it's impossible to escape it. Like, it's, we have planes, we have traffic. I live right next to the interstate as well, you know, and then people walking upstairs, downstairs, you know, it's Sunday, so like they're working on something over there. I don't know what it is. And that's actually what woke me up this morning. I was like, I had my alarm set for 6.30. I was like, why are they up at 6 o'clock on a Sunday? Uh -huh. And what could they possibly be fixing up there? Dude, this morning, I woke up at 5.45. I was good. I was determined to go surfing this morning. And I it looked so good last night. Like, it was just like, 
not huge but clean and then i got up with full intentions of doing it and it just looked oh. subpar and i whatever happened with the weather between last night and tonight wasn't so good for surfing and i went back to sleep there you go man <laughs> gotta make a conscious decision yeah i was like this isn't worth it hmm. not worth getting out of bed this early and i also get i get phantom buzzing with my if i don't have my phone in my pocket i'll be like walking the dog and i think i got a cell phone text and my like i'll feel my leg vibrate or i think <laughs> i did and it's like wait i don't have my cell phone it's like your ear tingling it's like oh somebody's thinking about you <laughs> i don't know but it's just like this is bad this is what happens when you've had a cell phone for the past 15 years and oh yeah joe you might it's have been to in your pocket talks oh yeah <laughs> i i know i mean but i i feel like i'm pretty i'm i'm definitely not the worst i'm conscious of these things at least <laughs> yeah well this this has been awesome I, I feel like we've gone through a lot of great information and um definitely you know the he, stuff about the helix and lights and yeah. social media marketing is all all very useful for everybody yeah um, thank you for having me i really appreciate it yeah uh where can everybody go to find out more about you yeah so handle um at the great noise uh that's us on social media um we're at the great noise dot space uh which is our i guess online landing page but essentially uh, yeah we're on everything amazon itunes soundcloud spotify we're going to release an album next month that dates tentative but if you follow us on instagram you'll be given updates and this one's going to be pretty cool uh, we have four singles out right now, which you can view on all platforms, whatever you wish. Um, but I'm excited for the new stuff. This is stuff we all have kind of written. And, uh, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys it. Yeah, and by the time they actually hear this episode, it'll be out. Okay, cool. Yeah, really cool. So if you're if you're hearing us speak right now, you sh- you can go find this album. Yeah, go get it. Yep, we're, it's on Spotify. Check it out. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And not only are we musicians on this podcast, we're also time travelers. That's right. Oh, yeah. It's already yeah. October. Oh. Or something. I don't know. I don't know what date it is today. You might be in Hawaii already, Joe. It's true. Ooh. I don't think I don't think we've actually publicly said that to our audience yet, but because I should be pretty much there at this point by the time this episode comes out, I think it's okay to say that I will be moving to Hawaii um, my wife is being stationed there and so I'm going and <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on my ukulele skills some and, uh, I've, uh, been learning about slack key guitar and, uh, yeah, yeah, just like I'm ready. I'm, a, I mean, I'm going to miss people and places and everything about this, but it's temporary. I'm going to go do it and, uh, oh yeah. Do- you poor thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the wor- not the worst place to <laughs> be life. told to move to. I'll tell you. Yeah. Definitely not. Yeah. So Ryan, thank you. Yeah. I'll uh I'll probably see you at Alpha Music. That is. You will. I don't think you actually mentioned the name, but Ryan does work at Alpha Music. It's a great shop. I highly recommend it. Um, a great selection of stuff and a lot of friendly, friendly folks there, and they host some cool events like PedalCon that I got to go to, and they had a Martin guitar event and. Um, Micah does a Micah, uh, he figures all that out. He he's the brain. Them. Yeah, yeah. Micah Sproul is the brain, uh, and just he'll look at you like, like when he's got an idea, and you just know it's like, oh man, it's like, here we go. But uh, yeah, you know we have uh, we have some more events coming up too, like Taylor and Martin, or excuse me, Taylor and Gretch this year. We have Taylor and Gretch coming up this year. Um, which is even more, I think we're going to do a drum event too. And that's all free for everybody. Like, you know, we do giveaways, come in, be a nerd with us, get to know us, let us get to know you. I want to know what you're working on. I want to know what you're problem solving and I want to help you figure it out. You know, we all, that's how we all kind of approach it. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, working off of music. Come in and check us out. Um, it's a good time. Yeah. All right. See you, Ryan. Awesome. Have a All great right. afternoon. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Aaron. Yeah, you as well, man. Take it easy. All right. Take care. Yeah.